this lecture. Okay, there we go. This lecture addresses the patient care section of the National Health Careers Association certification exam for EKG technician. Here are the objectives. We're going to talk about obtaining a patient history, educating your patient about the procedure you're going to perform, about where to apply EKG electrodes on the patient, discuss some differences in special cases when it applies to putting on EKG electrodes. We're going to quickly uh, discuss HIPAA and its impact on your practice and then also direct you to the D2L site for a pamphlet that will give you a very good overview of how HIPAA impacts your practice. We're going to talk about recognizing the signs of cardiac compromise and what to do if you find those in responding to complications. And then we're going to list normal vital sign ranges for a given age group. First off, let's talk about preparing your patient. You need to gather a patient history. Now, this may have already been done by other folks uh, before they reach you to get an EKG taken, so you may not need to do this in all that much detail. But you should be able to say that you know that the patient's social, medical, and surgical histories, as well as current medications, are known to the rest of the, pr of the care team. Social history includes things like smoking, alcohol, or drug use. Uh, are they in a stressful relationship or are they having a high amount of stress at work? Do they exercise? And what are their general eating habits? Do they eat a healthy diet or do they eat that standard American diet that we've talked about, red meat and Krispy Kremes? In medical history, we want to know about previous medical conditions such as past heart attacks, strokes, heart murmurs, or potentially chronic conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which includes emphysema and bronchitis, or perhaps diabetes or hypertension. Ask female patients if they are pregnant. Ask about any allergies, and specifically about any sort of latex allergies, or if they've ever had trouble with adhesives from tape or past EKG experiences. Finally, you do need to ask them if they're experiencing any symptoms right now. You never know. You might be at the EKG station in the clinic, and they may have come directly from home. So they may not have seen a provider just a few moments before they came to you. So ask about things such as chest pain, difficulty breathing, lightheadedness, etc. What you can say is, ask the patient, is there anything I need to know right now that's bothering you? And if they do say anything, make sure that you contact the physician. As we continue to gather the patient's history, we'll need to talk about surgical history and document all surgeries, when, where it was performed, and any complications. Ask about things such as a history of valve re replacement, cardiac procedures such as stents or balloon angioplasty, bypass surgeries, also known as cabbages, have they had a pacemaker or a defibrillator implanted? Did they have any childhood cardiac surgeries? It's important to know these because they may change what their normal EKG will be. Obtain a medication history. Document allergies or adverse reactions in the past. Document all medications the patient's taking now. You need to know the name, the dose, how often, and what time of day it's taken. That can be pretty important because some medications, if they were taken just before the test, might actually alter the outcome. Ask about any over-the-counter herbal supplements and vitamins that the patient might be taken, taking. And finally, ask about birth control in women and erectile dysfunction medications in men. These may cause, especially the erectile dysfunction medications, may cause low blood pressure. We also need to make sure and educate our patients. Let the patient know what to expect during the test. More than likely, there will be materials available at your work site that can assist you with this, and hopefully they've been provided with some education before they show up for the EKG test itself. 
In general, an EKG allows a physician to assess the electrical activity of the heart. It's non-invasive, in other words, it doesn't penetrate the skin, it's painless, and in most cases only takes a few minutes. Do ask the patient that they remove electronic devices from their pockets. This would include things like cell phones or personal digital assistants. These could cause interference with the EKG machine. In most cases, you're going to obtain the EKG while the patient lies flat on their back or supine. Perhaps they'll have their head slightly elevated so that they make so it makes them a little more comfortable. Ask that they not make contact with the bed rails or anything else made of metal. This might interfere with the signal. Instruct the patient to remain as still as possible during the test. And here we're talking more about things like 12 lead EKG, which you saw in lab. Usually it takes about 10 seconds. Halter monitoring is a little different. It allows the patient to assess the electrical activity of the heart over a longer period of time and while the patient goes about their normal lives. It's not invasive and painless as well, and the patient will wear the electrodes from anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. They should also be asked to avoid having electronic devices in their pockets. They should be asked to wear loose-fitting clothes, and women can be told that a bra can be worn during halter monitoring. The patient should go about their daily activities. Obviously, their physician might tell them what they can and cannot do. But no showering, swimming, or other activities that will get the chest or the little heart monitor wet are allowed. Also, the patient will be given a journal and you are to instruct the patient to record events in their journal as they've been instructed by their physician. The physician may have particular things that he wants to know about, but in general, uh, patients are asked to document any episodes of chest pain or lightheadedness or sudden nausea or sweating. The patient may also be asked to make sure that they press uh, an event button on the halter monitor itself and that will be specific to the model that the patient is using. Another kind of test that an EKG technician might be uh, involved in is stress testing. Now stress testing determines how the heart functions under an increased workload from exercise or potentially from medication. These usually take about 10 minutes to complete the first step is to take a baseline EKG before the patient begins to exercise. Obviously, we don't know how the heart responded if we don't know what the heart was doing before they began to exercise. The next step is that the patient begins to exercise on a treadmill or perhaps a stationary bicycle. Uh, you would place the patient on the EKG monitor, usually 12 leads, and we'll talk about the placement of those here in a little bit and also on a BP cuff machine or a blood pressure monitoring machine of some sort. Usually a BP cuff around the arm. We'll have a picture for that for you here in a little bit. You continue a stress test until the target heart rate is reached or you detect symptoms or if the patient begins becoming complain or begins to complain of becoming ill or fatigued. A patient should be instructed to wear comfortable clothes and shoes to a stress test, and they shouldn't eat or drink anything for about three hours before the test. Now again, these, these instructions as far as eating and drinking may be different depending on your particular work site. Patients can, should continue their normal medications unless their physician has instructed them otherwise. You should tell the patient that they may stop the test at any time if they begin to feel ill. And after the exercise period is over, the patient may need to remain on the monitor as the EKG continues to be obtained to see how the heart responds to the ending of exercise. Potential complications during stress testing can include low blood pressure and abnormal heart rhythms but these usually resolve when exercise, to, exercise is stopped. If they don't, that would be cause to call the physician. In telemetry monitoring, 
We use uh, electrodes place, usually limb electrodes, bipolar leads, to continuously monitor the EKG, usually in an inpatient setting. Again, it's non-invasive and, pa and painless. EKG is monitored, the EKG is monitored uh, potentially even remotely, and alarms sound when dangerous rhythms are detected. This is also known as teletech, or uh, telemetry technician monitoring, and EKG technicians do that job. The patient should be advised that if the electrodes happen to fall off, that they should call you or other health hospital staff for replacement of the electrodes. Also, the patient should be instructed to, know it, to advise and not, notify hospital staff if they become ill. But that's pretty self-evident. If a patient suddenly has symptoms, we would hope they would call us. So let's talk about lead placement. This is our standard lead placement. Now we know that we don't necessarily place the right leg and left leg electrodes, the green and red, down on the thighs. We have a tendency to place them just above the level of the belly button on the chest or the abdomen. Also remember that the right arm and left arm may not be placed all the way out there on the uh, shoulders. They may be in a little bit so that they don't get moved around quite so much. On the left, you see the textbook anatomic positioning of the limb leads. This would be done potentially during 12-lead EKG monitoring. But these, uh, the diagram on the right most definitely shows us a normal placement of leads during telemetry and bedside monitoring. And when we say bedside monitoring, we would be thinking of you've been called to the emergency room to take a quick EKG uh, of a patient who's complaining of difficulty in breathing, but a 12-lead EKG hasn't been ordered. Or perhaps you would be asked to place a patient on EKG while they're awaiting treatment in the ER uh, in a bed, and, uh, and the physician has determined he wants EKG monitoring. So that one on the right is the most common placement of limb leads, but again, those leg leads are usually a bit higher and above the waistline. Next, let's talk about 12-lead EKG placement. And here's a patient being shown having a 12-lead EKG obtained. Now remember, machine-to-machine uh, -machine and facility-to-facility uh, -facility things may be a little different. You'll notice here that the limb leads have been placed on the lateral aspect of the upper arm and then on the anterior surface of the shins. Uh, the, the six chest leads are in a configuration that we haven't seen in our class, but it doesn't mean that you may not see it um, in a workplace, that this particular machine happens to bundle their, their six leads in two groups of three. That actually makes quite a bit of sense to me, because that means you don't have six of them all getting tangled up together like you've seen me fight in lab. On the right, you can see the picture of the of the correct placement of V1 through V6, the chest leads. V1 is placed at the right sternal margin at the fourth intercostal space. V2 is placed at the left uh, margin of the sternum in that same fourth intercostal space. V4 is then placed at the midclavicular line in the fifth intercostal space. V3 is then placed in between the two. V5 is at the anterior axillary line of the fifth intercostal space. And V6 is placed at the mid axillary line, fifth intercostal space. So you'll notice that V4, V5, and V6, they look like they go down the chest a little bit, but the brown, black, and purple dots are actually parallel. They're at the same level. So if you were to do this in reality, you would follow that fifth intercostal space back to the mid-axillary line to find V6. Next, let's talk about halter monitoring. Now in halter monitoring, things are a little bit different. You can disregard the full body 
uh, diagram here showing the limb leads. <clears throat> what I'm demonstrating here on the right one, uh, on the right full body, is that brown electrode that we've talked about in lab. How we place that in the V1 position at that right sternal margin in the fourth intercostal space. And that's demonstrated a little bit better on the diagram to the left. Uh, that V1 is placed in that, or that the brown electrode is placed in that V1. Also, this demonstrates the placement of the limb leads in a more ambulatory position where the patient can walk around. Obviously, in the full body diagram to the right, uh, a patient wouldn't be very comfortable walking around with electrodes on his thighs. So the on the left is most definitely the um, placement that you want to use uh, if you're attaching halter monitoring. Now remember, in class, I showed you multiple pictures of different ways to set up halter monitoring. This is the standard procedure that I have found, and it's the one that I'm most familiar with. But remember that you may do it differently depending on your work site. Next, we'll talk about stress testing, and here's that picture of a gentleman going through its stress test on a treadmill. The placement of the electrodes is exactly the same as it is for a 12 lead EKG as far as V1 through V6 is concerned, but now we do place those limb leads up on the thorax itself, up on the chest, so that the patient can move and walk appropriately. Obviously, if the leg electrodes were actually down on his legs while he's walking, that's going to give us a, a pretty messed up picture. We're going to have a, definitely have a wandering baseline and uh, significant somatic interference or muscle motion interference. So again, here is your placement for stress testing. Next, we're going to talk about... Um, some things that are a little more rare, and I have to admit that I had not heard of this before. I've done a little bit of research, and this shows the lead placement for a 12 lead EKG in pediatric patients that are less than two years old, according to the NHA study guide. Uh, the heart is more oriented towards the right side of the chest in patients that are less than two years of age. Now, obviously, this wouldn't be your call as the EKG technician. Uh, you might ask the question uh, of the physician, would you, if the patient's less than two years old, would you like me to take a right-sided 12 lead EKG? Uh, that would be a legitimate question to ask. Um, I think what this is going to come down to is you're just going to have to become familiar with the physicians that you work with uh, as to whether or not they want right-sided EKGs on their patients that are less than two years old. But there are also uh, adult patients who will have right-sided EKGs, and basically you just mirror the normal 12-lead EKG placement of these chest leads. Uh, you just mirror them. So V1 goes on the left, uh, sternal margin in the fourth intercostal space while V2 goes on the right then V4 goes at the midclavicular line in the fifth intercostal space V3 goes in between V2 and V4 then V5 goes to that anterior axillary line and V6 goes to the mid axillary line so there's really it's just a mirror image uh, the only thing you need to absolutely make sure that you do is document on the recording, on the EKG recording itself, that these were right-sided leads so that there isn't confusion. And finally, there's posterior placement, or V7, 8, and 9. Again, this is pretty rare, but sometimes can be taken if the interpretation of the 12 lead EKG leads us to believe that there is an inferior wall infarction. You're going to do this pretty rarely, but um, it is possible. V7 goes on the posterior axillary line, V8, fifth intercostal space. 
V8 goes on the mid-scapular line, or right down the shoulder blade, at the fifth intercostal space, and then V9 is placed right at the spinal margin. So right when you feel the spine, just a little off to the left of it is where you place V9. Again, you'll receive a direct order, and if you're unfamiliar at the moment, don't be afraid to say, hey, I've never done that before, and uh, ask someone to show you. Or uh, when you get to a job site, ask the question, do we take a lot of posterior lead uh, EKGs here? And, and re-familiarize yourself with the process. So let's talk about cardiac compromise. Signs and symptoms can include both fast and slow heart rates. Slow heart rates are actually a little more concerning because if the patient is in a stress test, we would expect their heart rates to go up a little bit, actually potentially quite a bit. Um, you'll remember I said in class that I had a stress test. It was a chemical or a nuclear stress test, and my target uh, heart rate was 143. That's pretty tachycardic. Uh, if I had become bradycardic in that situation, it would be much more, uh, much more concerning. Pallor. Pallor is just a bad color of the skin. Uh, some people will say it's kind of a grayish color. Diaphoresis is sweating, and that would be excess sweating, dripping sweating. Obviously, if you put a person on a treadmill or on a stationary bicycle so that they exercise, they're going to sweat some. Here what we're talking about is just undue sweating. Now, if the patient looks at you straight in the face and says, yeah, I'm a heavy sweater, well, more than likely he's not having problems. It's the one that sits there, looks like they're having a really hard time and is sweating a great deal that we worry about. Low blood pressure. Again, if you're being stress tested and your heart rate should increase, your blood pressure should come up a little bit along with it. Low blood pressure would be very concerning extremely high blood pressure would also be concerning, but an increase in blood, sugar, blood pressure should be expected. Difficulty in breathing. Now, obviously, the person may become uh, short of breath or begin breathing harder because they're exercising, but here, this would be the patient who's truly complaining, it's hard for me to breathe. That would be a reason to potentially stop the test. Anxiety or confusion. This is an early sign of a heart attack. So obviously we want to stop the test if anxiety or confusion becomes a problem. Cyanosis is bluish skin. And that means that the patient is not getting an adequate level of oxygen. This is usually going to be preceded by difficulty in breathing. If you see it, stop the test immediately. The same goes for chest pain or tightness in the chest. Stop the test. Nausea or vomiting. Weakness or fainting. Obviously, if the patient faints, they're going to fall to the ground. My recommendation to you would be to keep yourself safe. Don't try to catch the patient, but do try to protect their head as they fall. But try to catch this early. If the patient truly begins to complain of weakness, or another, another symptom would be lightheadedness, um, stop the test and, uh, and get the patient sitting down as soon as you can. Next is HIPAA, or the Health, Pro Health Insurance Protection and Accountability Act. It defines what is protected health information, or PHI, and it restricts the di distribution of PHI to persons having a direct role in the patient's care. Now, we could talk about this for hours alone, so I've put a brochure on the D2L site with a really good, quick overview of HIPAA that I think will serve you well for your certification exam, so make sure and take a look at that on the D2L site. Finally, we're going to talk about monitoring and responding to complications during stress testing. You need to watch the patient for abnormal vital signs arrhythmias, or signs of cardiac compromise that we discussed before. Watch the EKG, especially for PVCs, ventricular tachycardia, of course that's a lethal dysrhythmia potentially, superventricular tachycardia, but here you walk kind of a fine line. 
because sometimes the target heart rate may be in the supraventricular tachycardic range, such as mine. Mine was 143, so obviously they wanted me to reach a supraventricular tachycardic rate. And um, so it's, it's kind of a fine line. You wouldn't stop the test uh, as long as the patient was not showing, showing signs and symptoms of cardiac compromise. And then the other one would be heart blocks. Now, generally, heart blocks come along with bradycardia. So as we watch, and we already said that bradycardia would, might be a reason to stop the test, if the patient develops a heart block where they're dropping uh, QRSs for uh, P waves, and that would be a second-degree block, or if you suddenly see a complete dissociation between the P waves and the QRSs, that would be an immediate reason to stop the test. But know that uh, the EKG alone probably won't be the issue. You'll probably see signs of cardiac compromise uh, and notice that before you happen to notice the heart block on the EKG. Another thing to watch for are signs of ischemia. Ischemia can include T-wave inversion on the EKG, or in other words, a T-wave that was upright or positive suddenly becomes negative. So an upright T-wave should be expected in the limb leads, lead 1, lead 2, and lead 3. If you suddenly see that flip upside down, that's a sign of ischemia, and that's a cause for stopping the test immediately. And it has to be remembered that while we're trying to reach a, a, a target heart rate, in a stress test, that it is the ischemia signs, it's the signs of ischemia that the doctor may actually be wanting to achieve to see if the heart can handle the stress. And it would be the ischemia, and remember that ischemia is a lack of oxygen to a particular area of the heart muscle, that may actually be the reason they're giving the stress test in the first place, and oftentimes is. The other thing to watch out for would be ST segment changes. And ischemia, early changes in ischemia can include ST segment depression and ST segment elevation. But also remember that ST segment elevation is indicative of infarction as well. And finally, we're going to talk about what to do if you see these things during a stress test. Well, luckily, most complications that you might find or you might see, will resolve with rest. You just stop the test, sit the patient down, and the patient, uh, the patient will get better, is the bottom line. Obviously, you want to call the physician, because if there is a complication, they need to know immediately. If you set them down, uh, sit them down and have them rest, and low blood pressure does not improve, have the patient lie down with their legs elevated if they can tolerate it. Now remember, you just got them off a, off a stress test, off a treadmill or a stationary bicycle, so you never know, they may not tolerate laying flat very well. And obviously you need to call the physician in this case. Rarely, patients may suffer cardiac arrest, requiring CPR and the use of an automated external defibrillator. Remember, we said that there are reasons why you can see complications such as ventricular tachycardia, and if that, can, and if that happens, you may have a cardiac arrest situation on your hands. So we also talked about PVCs as being one of the complications, and if that happens just right, obviously you know that that can lead to ventricular fibrillation. Then, of course, the safety factor is report any concern you might have to the physician. If uh, something just doesn't feel right, call the doc. That's what they're there for. Well, I hope this um, presentation, which is about half an hour long, has helped you in uh, understanding a little bit more about the patient care aspects of the National Health Careers Association EKG Technician Test. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me. Through the D2L site is the best way to get a hold of me. And um, I hope to see you next week in class. Thanks.